Okay guys, today we're going to be talking about hair care product knowledge. Now what I'm going to do over the next several chapters is I'm going to be um, cutting them apart and only doing so much theory at a time um, to give you more time to absorb the information. We're probably going to be doing extra cahoots, extra quizlets. Um, these tests are very long and there's a lot of information in here and it's something that maybe just doesn't come as naturally to us as cosmetologists. So something we want to focus on, get this information down pat, and then go ahead and successfully complete the test. All right. So cosmetic classifications, all right. We have solutions, suspensions, emulsions, ointments, soaps, and powders in cosmetology. We're going to be going over each one of these. Okay, so the first one is a solution. Two kinds of evenly dispersed molecules. All right, a solute is a substance that dissolves into a liquid and forms a solution. Their example on the picture is hot cocoa. Okay, so you take that packet of hot cocoa powder, you put it into the water, you stir it, and it dissolves in the water. The uh, powder is the solute. The solvent is a substance that's able to dissolve another substance, water, and when a solution can't hold any more solute, it's saturated. Okay, so let's look at this a second. I have some test tubes here that I want to use. Um, here we have a test tube with some water in it, and I have some sugar. Um, some of the other areas were kind enough to supply me with some things for today. And I'm going to do this over top of a, um, of a bin in case I make a mess. So I've got sugar and I've got water. And I'm going to pour some sugar into my water. So this would be just like as if you were having iced tea at home or something. And you were creating this um, sugary drink. Or maybe you were making um, uh, Kool-Aid at home. All right, so you know you're going to stir it or you're going to shake it. Okay, so the sugar is dissolved in the water. And that's what makes our drink sweet. Okay, again, the water is the solvent. Okay, remember a solvent. You can see it's getting clearer and clearer as I'm talking. The solvent is what um, dissolves the item and the solute, the solute is what goes in. So our sugar is the solute, our solvent is the water, okay? You can see it in there, it's still trying to absorb all the sugar. So if this would be warm water, it would have dissolved more quickly. Now it says they're saturated, okay? So if I keep pouring the sugar in here, let me get my fingers out of the way, and I keep pouring it in there, Okay, we're going to get to the point where the water can't absorb any more sugar. Okay, so you can see the sugar sitting on the top there. This solution is saturated. Let's try to shake it up and see if it really is saturated. Yep, there's still dry sugar on the top. It just can't, simply can't hold anymore. Okay, solvent is the water. The sugar is the um, solute and now it is saturated. Okay, water is considered the universal solvent because it's capable of dissolving more things than anything else on the uh, planet. The, re the way I always think of a solvent is if I'm painting something and I need to clean up a brush, I might go get a solvent to clean up my brush like acetone or something that's going to dissolve the paint. So something that dissolves something else. Okay, a suspension. All right, so our most famous suspension would be oil and vinegar. If you've ever bought Italian dressing, you know that if you have oil and vinegar in the dressing, okay, you can see that they're staying separate from each other. You've got the oil, you've got the vinegar, and this is what will happen when your container sits in the refrigerator in between uses. And then before you want to use the product, 
the um, Italian dressing, you do this and it will stay suspended for a period of time and you use it then when you get it out of the refrigerator the next time, it's going to be separated again, okay? That's a suspension. Anything you have to shake before you can use it. Another example is calamine lotion, that pink lotion. If you've ever gotten um, poison ivy, you put that on, but you have to shake it because it's like a powder in water and you shake it up and then you apply it. And that powdery substance in the calamine lotion is what dries up your um, uh, poison ivy. Okay, an emulsion. When two or more immiscible substances are united by a binder or gum-like substance. So everybody knows that if you take water and oil, we all know water and oil don't mix. Okay, there's the oil sitting right on top of the water. Okay, and again, if I want this to mix and I take my lid, I can disperse it for a second, but it's going to very quickly try to separate again. Okay, so I'm just going to set this aside and I'm going to come back to it. So I'm just sitting it in my container there. So oil and water don't want to mix. So the way you think about this is it's immixable. <clears throat> so I want you to think of the word immixable, which isn't even a word. We're just making it up. Immixable, put another M in there, make it more official. Immixable, immiscible. If so, if you say it almost the same way, that will help you remember. If it's mixable, something that easily mixes like that collet in the water, then it is miscible. Okay, so the spelling's just a little bit different. You're taking the X-A-B-L-E and you're changing it to S-C-I-B-L-E. Mixable, miscible, immixable, immiscible. Same thing, the word's just a little bit different. Okay, so they use a binder or a gum-like substance to hold them together. All right, so you can have oil and water or water and oil. Okay, an example of oil and water would be if you would look at the ingredients on here. I don't know if I can find the ingredients. The first ingredient um, would be water, and then they add an oil-like substance to this. Okay, so it's primarily water with some oil in it. That makes perm solution. On the other hand, Cold cream is primarily oil and they add a little bit of water to it. Now, when I was little, like my grandma used to use Pond's cold cream. And every time you open this up, this is Noxema, but when you opened up Pond's cold cream, there were always a couple droplets of water sitting on the top because we know oil and water don't like to mix. So sometimes they're under that tension, they're being held together by that, um, by that gum but sometimes a couple drops will come free and you could see that in the Pond's cold cream, you'd see those couple droplets of water. Okay, so usually used in cosmetology would be this. So think of water, almost everything we use, the first ingredient is water, shampoo, conditioner, like everything. So think, okay, the primary thing is water and they just add a little bit of oil to it. We do not use products like this. You can buy it for at home, okay? This is, like I said, something my grandma would have used. Okay, so we don't primarily use water and oil. Okay, ointments. You can see the example there. Okay, when you have a organic substance and a medicinal agent usually found in a semi-solid form, okay? So when you have something, um, when I think of the medicinal agent, I always think of um, um, using chapstick on my lips. So it's the same kind of form, but it has that medicine in it. Like when you put it on and it, it uh, moisturizes and it heals your dry chapped lips. So that is an ointment, ointment. Okay, soap. Okay, back in the pioneer days, you wanted soap, you went out and you butchered something, 
a pig, a cow, something like that. You got the fat off of it. You made a fire. And when you, in the fire, you would have ashes and you would mix the fat and the ash, ashes, okay? And you would cook it all together and you would have a form of soap. Now it was gritty, it was nasty, but it did clean. Now who thought of mixing fat and wood ashes? I don't know. But that's how they did it back in the pioneer days. So a mixture of fat and oils, converted to fatty acids by heat and then purified. Luckily we don't have to use that today. Powders, okay? Equal mixtures of inorganic and organic substances that do not dissolve in water. So our um, uh, eyeshadow is the example that they're using there. And I can't get this open. I forgot how difficult these are to open. Okay, so we've got eyeshadow. This is just a little sample. Okay. Okay, inorganic and organic um, items that don't dissolve in water. Okay, so if I went back, I couldn't get this, I couldn't get my water to turn blue for me. All right, let me check and see how my oil and water is going. Wow, that went a lot faster than I thought it was. There's my oil and water breaking free from each other because there's no binder in there to hold them together. They are immiscible or immixable. Okay, shampoos. They clean your scalp and your hair to remove foreign matter without adversely affecting your scalp or your hair. So when I was a brand new cosmetologist and I was primarily a shampoo girl, um, we had this uh, shampoo called apple pectin. You might still be able to buy it today. And it smelled like apples. Oh my gosh, it smelled so good. And they even had perms that smelled like apples. It was fantastic. But because I was a shampoo girl and I was shampooing all day long, I would go home and at night my hands would crack open and they would bleed. Okay, this shampoo was adversely affecting hair and skin. Putting it on someone once, you know, while they were there for their appointment, probably not a bad deal, but buying it and going home and using it on your hair, not a great idea. Now you have to remember, this was before, you know, we didn't do foils. You know, we did do perms. Um, we did pull a couple people's hair through the cap. Um, hair coloring was very, very, very small. Perming was very, very large. Um, but, and we didn't retail any shampoo or conditioner or anything. So this was just a cheap shampoo that we used and conditioner that smelled really good. All right. It should be, um, a soothing, relaxing experience when you go to get a shampoo. So if you get a job in a salon and your primary, primary job, first of all, is to shampoo, you need to be the best shampooer that they've ever seen in there. Why? Number one, it will tell your bosses that you care about anything you do. So even being low man on the totem pole, you're doing your very best. Number two, you will get lots and lots of tips from very grateful clients if you do a very good soothing relaxing but thorough shampoo you don't want to be just like all mamsy pamsy on their scalp and it doesn't really feel like anything happened um improper cleansing allows a breeding place for disease causing bacteria can lead to scalp disorders and even hair loss all right how shampoo works so i don't know if any of you had a light bright when you were a little kid but you had this um, thing and you had a picture on it and you would put the little um, pegs in and it would create a picture. And when you were all done with all your pegs, you could see that it was a picture of something like a flower and the light would glow through the pegs and it was really awesome. Okay, so the light bright looks almost like this. I like to think of it like this, not having that flat end. Okay, so you have a strand of hair, okay, and it's been three days since you shampooed and you're starting to get some dirt and some oil built up on your hair and it's time to get shampooed. So you get out your shampoo, you put it in your hands and you start rubbing it into your hair. Your shampoo 
has these cleansing agents, these surfactants, you'll see this many, many times, surfactants in them that consist of two parts. Okay, you've got a lipophilic end and a hydrophilic end. Well, if you go to see a hydroelectric plant, you're going to a great big dam somewhere where they're using water to make electric, hydro. So this end loves water. This is the end that's round. This end loves oil, okay? So what happens is these little surfactants come and the pointy end sticks into the dirt and the oil. And as you manipulate the scalp and you're scrubbing, it's causing them to roll up into, into larger balls. So you get all done shampooing, you've done your scrubbing, everything's awesome. And you turn on the spigot and you have water and the water is going past the hair as you're rinsing and the water loving ends are following the water down the drain pulling the dirt and oil off of your hair and your scalp that's how shampoo works okay so you need both ends of the surfactant you need the oil loving end and the water loving end hydro water lipo oil okay so that's how it works okay hard water Around here, we mostly have hard water because of just the geography of where we live. Okay, it contains calcium, magnesium, iron. You know, if you live out where you have a, a well or anything like that, you know this very, very well. If you live in a town or city, um, it's probably treated and you don't even realize that you have hard water. But hard water will prevent shampoo from lathering. Now, I live in a town and my water's treated, but if I go to the beach, and I take a shower, I'm like, oh my gosh, like, is this soap ever gonna rinse off of me? Like, it feels like you're soapy and you can't get the soap off. That's soft water. We're used to lathering up, we're taking our shower, the water hits it, and it, that soapy feeling's gone. That's hard water. Hard water does not want to lather up, okay? Soft water has little amounts of mineral and it's preferred because it lathers freely and again, water is the primary ingredient in most shampoos, most conditioners, most everything. So when you pick up something and you look at the ingredients, let me see if this will work. Okay. It says first weight ingredient is water, then it's stearic acid, then it's something I can't pronounce. Okay, that goes in order. So whatever had the most, whatever that product has the most of in is the first ingredient down to the last ingredient. So it goes, okay, it has mostly this, a little bit less, 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 down to the end. So this is primarily made up of water. Okay, two methods of water purif purification. Sedimentation and filtration. Okay, sedimentation. Whoops, let me get my little drawer here okay so you've got some nice h2o in here and you're at the lake okay and you look out at the lake and oh it is just beautiful the water's so clear and it's so blue and it's so pretty and you get in and you start swimming and what happens you look down and it's like you're swimming in mud okay looks terrible all right, then you go back and you go, you get out to eat. And as you're sitting there eating, what happens is all that stuff you stirred up from the bottom of the lake settles back down, sedimentation, it settles down, and then the water's clear again. So that's one way that they um, purify water, okay? So if you, um, like where I live, we have a big tank of water, it comes in and the bad stuff settles to the bottom and they take the good water that we drink off the top. That's how it works. Now, filtration. Just think of a, a coffee pot, all right? So you've got your filter, you've got your coffee grounds in there and you pour the water in, okay? What comes out down here? Okay, the coffee grounds stay there. 
So this would be the same thing if you were working with water and you were trying to clean it. If you pour it through a filter, any bad stuff and debris will stay in the filter and the good water will be down here at the bottom. Okay, so you can have filtration and sedimentation and then they will also add chlorine to this water to help kill off any bacteria. So the water's treated before we, we drink it. Okay, and that's all the further we're gonna go for this portion.